Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hello, Peter. Hey, Bob. <laughs> How's it going? Good. What do we got going on today? We got a lot of questions around one particular topic, actually one paper, and the title of that paper is Once Weekly Semaglutide in Adults with Overweight or Obesity, and I don't think that a lot of people would be uh, talking about this or asking this if the results of the paper weren't so freaking remarkable as far as the weight reduction with that study. So you know, a lot of studies were, a lot of questions were around the study. Can you go over the findings of the study? What are the implications? Do we need a drug for obesity? What the heck is semaglutide? Um, how does it compare to other drugs in diets, uh, et cetera, et cetera? I think people want to get more clarity around this study. Yeah, this study, um, did it come out earlier this year? Was this early 21? Yes. Yeah. You know, obviously, this is a study that those of us who spend time in this space knew a lot about and were kind of anticipating the results of this for a while. Um, there are other drugs in this class, liraglutide, um, that about six years ago showed also very promising results. Um, and, and basically, uh, once this study came out, I would say, you know, many of our patients were asking about it and we actually did a journal club on this paper, this particular paper, the New England Journal of Medicine paper, uh, I think back in the spring. Uh, so it's inter it's it's great to see that a lot of people are basically kind of wanting to to go deep on this. And I, I think as we'll get into today, you can't really go deep on this paper without doing a little bit of background on what GLP-1 is, uh, because of course this drug is effectively just an analog of GLP-1. So um yeah i think we're about to go pretty deep on this topic so let's start with um glp ones huh yeah let's do it okay so i guess the easiest way to start this discussion is to really do it through the lens of what is an incretin or what is the incretin effect um now, I, I, I've, I've read that people have been aware of this phenomenon or something like it since the 1800s. Uh, I still don't understand how that's the case because without being able to measure an insulin response, I'm not sure how people would have suspected this because it's, at least to my perhaps naive view, only when you can measure insulin can you understand what the incretin effect is. But it effectively comes down to a bit of a mismatch between how oral and intravenous uh, glucose are processed. But let, let's take a step back from all of that and just make sure everybody's up to speed on insulin and glucagon, because these are two hormones that you have to really understand um, to get what uh, incretins are, and then by extension, to appreciate what semaglutide is doing. And again, we're, we're, all of this is, is is sort of prologue to make sure that we understand how semaglutide works. So <clears throat> let's start with the basics. Again, I know many of you realize this, but it's, um, it's, it's always worth reiterating. So insulin is secreted by beta cells in the pancreas. So the pancreas has two broad functions. It has an endocrine function and an exocrine function. Um, so the exocrine function is kind of the, the local digestive function. And the endocrine function is the more systemic function. So this, um, the release of insulin and glucagon from beta and alpha cells respectively fit into the uh, endocrine portion of this. And I think I could be wrong on this. Um, my recollection is that the, by mass, only 5% of the pancreas is really endocrine function is alpha and beta cells, that the majority of the pancreatic mass is for the exocrine, the local digestive function. Anyway, so these beta cells, they secrete insulin. Um, and insulin really has pretty significant effects on, on obviously muscle cells, fat cells, and liver cells. Um, and it signals all of these tissues to take up glucose. Um, it also tells the liver to stop making glucose. So again, what what's the purpose of this? It's insulin is a signal of the fed state, uh, and it's particularly sensitive, of course, to carbohydrates. So it's saying when carbohydrates are abundant, we need to take 
glucose up into cells and we need to stop making more glucose because remember the liver has many functions, but one of the most important functions of the liver, in fact, you could argue the function with which we would die the quickest uh, is its ability to make glucose and put it into circulation. And this is a very important thing that insulin regulates. It also regulates the output of glucagon. So what is glucagon? So glucagon is produced by alpha cells of the pancreas um, and it increases blood glucose via hepatic glucose production, via stimulating glycogenolysis, so breaking glycogen into glucose and gluconeogenesis. Um, and it also increases lipolysis and ketone production. So you can see how there's a bit of an antagonistic relationship between these hormones, and therefore when one goes up, it would regulate the other. Okay, so how does all this fit into the incretin effect? Well. I think um, a figure says a thousand words here. So Bob, let's let's take a look at figure one and we'll kind of walk people through this because it is pretty interesting. And I think if you haven't seen this before, it's a bit of a head scratcher. Absolutely. Okay. I pulled it up. Okay. So what you're looking at here are three graphs uh, and let's talk through each of them. So the upper one shows on the x-axis as they all do time, so time in minutes. And here on the uh, y-axis, you're seeing plasma glucose. Okay. So um, this is in response to both an oral and intravenous glucose load. So that means in the solid gray um, circles is what your is, is the measured plasma glucose level following a glucose load. So these are done in uh, picomole per liter, but this translates very well to um, I think picomole per liter actually is equivalent to milligrams per deciliter. So you're looking at uh, normal glucose, say in the 90s, following the ingestion of oral glucose, you see it goes up and um, you know, it peaks at about 60 minutes and then kind of returns such that by, you know, three hours, it's effectively back to baseline. And the intravenous glucose dose is delivered in what's called an isoglycemic manner, meaning the IV of glucose is titrated to match that dose. Um, the, sorry, not to match the dose, to match the glycemic response. Okay. What's interesting is when you look at the two figures below. So the first figure, which is the green figure, shows what happens to insulin under these two conditions. So now again, we're sampling peripheral insulin. And in the first example, you see insulin goes up. And this would be sort of what you would expect from an oral glucose tolerance test. So insulin peaks at about 90 minutes. Uh, returns to baseline in about three to four hours. But what's really interesting here is when you look at the insulin response under the intravenous glucose administration, you see it's a fraction of what is delivered or um, appreciated in the oral glucose administration. Um, in fact, it almost looks like a flat line. So what explains that difference? Well, that difference, which is basically the shaded green area, is referred to as the incretin effect, which we'll talk about in a moment. So looking at the bottom graph now, you see the same effect, but for glucagon. So remember, glucagon is secreted by the pancreas as well, and it acts <clears throat> primarily on the liver to regulate glucose output, glycogen breakdown, and glucose production. And you can see with the oral glucose administration, um, the attenuation of glucagon is less than with the intravenous administration. So again, that delta is referred to here as the incretin effect. So why does this happen? I guess is the question, Bob. What, what, what insights do you have on this? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following. Ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed 
The Qualies, which were a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.